Good afternoon. We are coming to the end of our very intense and productive meeting. I would like um, first to thank our co-chairs who are here on the panel, Mr. Advani, Marcos Bulgoroni, and Eduardo Elstein for providing us with guidance during our discussions the last 36 hours. I have the great pleasure, in addition, to greet the people who joined the panel, Sir Michael Rake and Sir Michael, um, you really made a special effort uh, after uh, your flights were cancelled. Uh, uh, so we appreciate your participation. And um, as the representative of the host country from the government, Marcos Peña, the chief of the cabinet of ministers of Argentina. In addition, um, we will be moderated by Gabriele Frias, the closing session, and the um, very closing words uh, will be my colleague uh, Philipp Rösler um, to close the session. But I have also two other special guests, very honored guests, whom I will introduce in a moment, because they will make a very, for us, very important announcement, governor and minister. But first, I was thinking how to summarize my own impressions of this meeting. And instead of giving you a summary of all the um, multifold sessions and many impressions, let me just refer to one special meeting which I will not forget very soon. It was a meeting this morning with the global shapers, with the young generation. And if anybody had any doubt about the future of Latin America, he should have participated at this meeting. There was such an entrepreneurial strength and what was particularly also important for me is to show how this generation is future-oriented and how this generation is eager to serve society. I would argue in the future the dividing line in societies will not be anymore between the left and the right. That's the past. The dividing line in the future will be between those who embrace the future and who know that sometimes to build a great future, you have to make short-term sacrifices, like every entrepreneur usually has to do. So to be future-oriented is not a matter of age. I have also met many business leaders, many among the people here in the audience who really will join forces to create a great future for Latin America. I have one, just one thing to add. We look very much at the government to undertake the necessary reforms, to be responsive and responsible. But also we, business leaders, in, a, in times which are so driven by fast change, I think we have to be responsive and responsible. We also have to fulfill our obligation to interact with those who feel left behind in this fast-changing world. Now, my main task this afternoon is to welcome 
Governor Geraldo Alcmin, the governor of the state of Sao Paulo, and Governor, I spent um, the first two days of this week in Sao Paulo, and I have to say, as since many, many years, I'm always so impressed by the vibrancy of this city. And actually, coming from Switzerland, I'm somewhat jealous because I noticed that the state of Sao Paulo has a bigger cross-national product compared to Switzerland. And you would deserve, as a state, to be actually part of the G20. And I also have the great pleasure to welcome and honor Mr. Minister Marcos Pereira, the Minister of Industry, Foreign Trade and Services of Brazil. And I think, Minister, you were participating at uh, a ministerial meet meeting this morning, which included the ministers of trade of Mercosur and of the Pacific Alliance. And as far as I hear, uh, the spirit of the meeting corresponded exactly to what we discussed so often here, the need for the region to grow together and to create one powerful Latin America. And now, Governor, may I ask you to join me here and Minister and to announce um, important news. Minister, to you. I would like to thank uh, Professor Klaus Schwab. The, um, I would also like to greet Minister Peña. I would like to greet you all, ladies and gentlemen. We are so happy to be in Buenos Aires at this very important meeting. And let me stress the enthusiasm that we perceive as part of the youth participating here. The future is starting today and its name is youth. We are very happy to see the effort for youth to take more active part in political life and in all activities. Let me say that we are really very happy and very much honored by the presence of the minister as well and we are very pleased to announce that we are hosting the World Economic Forum in Latin America in Sao Paulo next year. You will all be very welcome to Sao Paulo. We have the Latin American Memorial, a very important cultural venue which looks to all of Latin America. Sao Paulo is a cosmopolitan city, and I like to joke by saying that uh, Sao Paulo is the land where the Japanese speak Portuguese with an Italian accent. So, very welcome to Sao Paulo. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor Professor Schwab. I would just like to say a few words because I think the governor made the great announcement which to us Brazilians and residents of Sao Paulo, of the state of Sao Paulo, is very important. We are very happy and very proud that the World Economic Forum of Latin America will be hosted next year in Sao Paulo. The, this is my third edition of the Latin American Forum. The first time was in Medellin, Colombia, last year. The second time was in Davos uh, in January this year, and this is the third time. So we'll certainly be together at the fourth edition in Sao Paulo. So congratulations, Mr. Governor. Congratulations, Professor Schwab, for on choosing Sao Paulo. And Governor, thank you for uh, this opportunity. And uh, this morning, we talked to President uh, Michel Temer on the phone, 
and he confirms that the federal government will also be committed to this edition of the World Economic Forum on Latin America. On Latin America. I also talked to my colleague, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Aloysio Nunez, and as Professor Schwab mentioned, we have just uh, concluded a meeting of Mercosur and the Pacific Alliance countries, and all of the uh, Brazilian diplomatic corps, Itamarati, and the foreign minister allows me to say this, we are committed to welcoming the members of Latin American governments as well as the representatives of the productive sector and of academia in Sao Paulo, which is our native town, our native city. Thank you very much. Okay, so we are ready to start. Good afternoon and parabéns, Governador. We're going to Sao Paulo, so we're happy for, for our friends from Sao Paulo and the region to host uh, 2018 Sao Paulo, the World Economic Forum meeting. And welcome, welcome to our closing plenary uh, to reflect on the theme of this meeting, fostering development and entrepreneurship in the fourth industrial revolution. I'm happy to um, have a fantastic group of panelists to close this session. Uh, Geraldo Arquim, the governor of Sao Paulo and host, of course, of the next World Economic Forum Latin America. Uh, also, uh, Ashish Advani, president and chief executive officer from JA Worldwide USA. Um, also, I thank you very much, Sir Michael Rake, chairman from BT Group United Kingdom. Uh, Marcos uh, Peña, uh, Chief of uh, Cabinet of Ministers for Argentina, representing, of course, Buenos Aires. Thank you so much. We have had uh, so, such productive meetings, Marcos Peña. I also want to thank Eduardo Elstein, Chairman, IRSA Inversiones y Representaciones Argentina. And last but not least, Marcos Bulgeroni, Executive Edit, um, Director uh, from Pan American Energy Argentina. So we have three co-chairs present in uh, this meeting. So uh, the general question is what will be your takeaway from these three days? But the more specific question, what are the leadership imperatives for governments, for business, for industry? Who wants to start? Marcos. Well, I'll start then. First of all, I would like to thank the World Economic Forum for having chosen Buenos Aires. This meeting was very important for us because it was a long time without being close to the world, without the opportunity to have this kind of meeting. And I think this leads to the response to the question you just asked. And uh, in the same vein as uh, Professor Schwab, I think the first learning after this meeting, and also in terms of what we need, going forward is the full conviction that we need to embrace the future, we need to embrace the time we're living in, we need to have a positive attitude in light of the tremendous changes taking place, but we are convinced that a more integrated world with a more interconnected humankind, with more integrated free societies and more democratic will make mankind, our region and our country better. And we are in the midst of that transition process as a country that was basically closed down and that is now discovering that the world is an opportunity rather than a threat. But this requires leadership on the part of us all to tap into the potential we have as a country and region. I would also like to thank Professor Schwab, the Forum and Marisol for organizing this meeting. One of the things I take away from this meeting is the fact that the world has changed so much in terms of, for example, the relations that the U.S. wants to have with the rest of the world on the trade front, and in particular with Latin America, also Brexit and Europe, which has changed a lot. And that, to us and our region, poses a great challenge, but also means a great opportunity. So the discussions at the forum 
have centered around the opportunities we have as a region and that we need to take advantage of, which means that both regional blocs, Mercosur and the Pacific Alliance, need to find ways to strengthen that relationship and to start walking the way together. There's also this need for a new willingness to redesign Mercosur, and there is a new impetus there, I think, that gives us a great opportunity as part of which Argentina and Brazil and Paraguay and Uruguay are in sync again. And finally, we need to mention the importance of starting to increase inter-regional trade as well. Considering the doubts and uncertainties with regards to the United States, I think there's a great opportunity for us. Eduardo Alstein, please. When you just refer to imperative leadership, I thought, um, what is a true leader? A true leader is the one that boosts others. And isn't it quite something to have this meeting in Buenos Aires? Uh, we are proud to have managed to get it to come to Buenos Aires. And with so many representatives of the youth leaders, and if there's one thing I admire, Professor Schwab, it's not just gathering the most select representatives of business and political power. It's about discovering young leaders. And when you talked about leadership, I was thinking about this new phase in Argentina. It's over 33 years of democracy now. And uh, my first foreign investor said to me that the Argentines work the way things happened in the Malvinas Island. The only ones that stood out were the ones who acted on their own, the pilots. But the logistics, they couldn't get right. They couldn't coordinate that. And I think it is a great privilege for Argentina to have a president that has been the president of the most popular football club in the country. Because sometimes working as part of a team, working as the uh, national coach, working to get people to work together as a team yields a lot more results than if you work on your own. And today I saw representatives uh, of Congress, governors, ministers, and I felt that it wasn't just about rhetoric. I got the feeling that things are working. So the fact that the forum is here was a true effort because for decades we were wondering when it would come to Argentina. So having the young leaders, I think, also gives us a big boost. Thank you. You came to this World Economic Forum. What's your takeaway? What are those leadership imperatives yeah. that you see? So, I mean, briefly, as, as you asked us to be, um, first of all, leadership's really important. Leader, political leadership, business leadership has never been more important because we have to, again, make the arguments for globalization, for free trade. We have to recognize the facts of hundreds of millions of people taken out of poverty, of creating new markets for the West, of developing medicines, of investment right across the world. And we have to remake these arguments. And they're complex because we also have to recognize that society has begun to lose its trust in the establishment right across the world. And we saw uh, Professor Schwab before the uh, Davos uh, Review Edelman uh, survey that showed that the people have lost trust in the establishment by which they mean politicians, business leaders, the established media, and indeed NGOs, which kind of wipes out Davos as an, you know, in that sense. And clearly, you know, we've seen this in some of the populist movements and the way they operate. We've seen this, uh, depending on your point of view, politically, where people who felt left behind by globalization, left behind by industrialization, left behind by technology, have kind of rebelled. And we have to understand that. I think that's a very important part of Brexit, which is a long subject of its own, but is, uh, you know, for many of us, a, a deeply saddening uh, experience. And we do need to remember that the whole point of the European Union was about peace. You know, we've had the longest period of peace and prosperity in Europe's history. And it would be very unwise to take any line 
that directly or indirectly damage that. But again, we see right across Europe concern about immigration. Yeah. We see protectionism. We see jingoism. We see things that are deeply unattractive. And we really have to, together, business uh, politicians work together to lead and once again make the arguments for a liberal, open society. Thank you. Ashish. So speaking from the perspective of civil society, I think what Professor Schwab said about social entrepreneurs was my big takeaway from a leadership standpoint. You know, leaders have to think forward, potentially very forward, and uh, social entrepreneurship is now firmly part of civil society. I think we should recognize that, and they speak with a voice like, a, like civil society has. And to have them at this conference was wonderful, but to ensure that they get the funding they need to scale. I think this is an opportunity for good leadership in Latin America to be ahead of anywhere else in the world to arrange for the impact investing to help social entrepreneurs scale. So that was my big takeaway. Thank you very much. That was my general question, but I wanted to divide the rest of our conversation into the main topics that we, we covered during these three days. And uh, of course, key right now is the fourth industrial revolution for the entire region. How do we make it an asset and not another gap that we need to bridge? So technology um, is not going to equalize the playing field. Your policies, government policies, are going to make the difference. So how do we make sure Technology reaches everyone, and everybody can understand it and use it properly. Marcos Peña would like to hear your opinion. I think there are two dimensions to this. One relates to the challenge of inclusion in a highly unequal society. This is a region with vast potential, but with huge inequality and high poverty levels, which means that changes have different impacts on different segments of society. So we think one of the key pillars as part of that dimension is linked to the challenge in education. Education as a challenge that should not have to do with any nostalgic approaches. It should be targeting the 21st century regarding technology as an ally, but also considering this is a human process where teachers, families, and the educational community have a very important role to play. And another key pillar has to do with the tensions in democracy. Obviously, technology and changes in communications are also bringing tensions and challenges to democracies in our region. But they also bring opportunities. However, it is very important for political leadership in these areas and for social leaders as well to be able to grasp that this world that has changed and this society that has also changed needs institutions that must also change. Our institutions were designed for a world that no longer exists. And on top of it, there's still the institutional weakness as compared to developed countries. If we don't resolve those structural issues, it'll be harder to develop with uh, equal opportunity and inclusion. And finally, there's the main challenge for economic policies, especially job creation policies and uh, policies on territorial development. Thank you. On the youth, so we can include, um, you know, their opportunities, but also the youth in the region. There's a young, it's a young continent. We talk to many global shapers, and uh, of course they have so much energy. Professor Schwab just attested to that. And um, the question is, how are we going to listen to them better? Ashish, you work with the youth. So we work with youth. We spend our entire time listening to them. But from the perspective of the region and this conference, you know, the World Economic Forum has a global shaper survey which surveys youth in many countries, I'm sure over 100 countries. And um, there are very concrete lessons that one can learn from listening, <laughs> believe it or not, to youth. And I think uh, packaging the results of surveys such as that to inform the agenda of this conference, but also policy making, I think is an opportunity we should take full advantage of. Uh, Governor, to Governor Akim, uh, trust has been, of course, a repeated subject. Uh, at this meeting, but also clearly looking at Brazil, it's an important, it has been an important issue. Um, so how do we make sure that the young generation trust the older generations and older generations also open that door for younger generations, which is a big issue in the region?
Well, we've had an important demographic change in our countries, which uh, were young countries in the past and now are mature countries headed towards the old age segment. So we've had a major demographic change. change. Brazil is now working on a set of reforms, including a social security reform. The other reform is on labor. So we have laws dating back to the past century for a world in which employment will be the major challenge. Technology brings unemployment as well. Agriculture mechanizes, industry robotizes, there's automation there. So the big challenge for the world will be the issue of employability. So I think the old approach to education is no longer good because now we have fast pace in, in jobs. Um, Sao Paulo is the largest sugarcane producer in the world. And those who used to cut the sugarcane have disappeared because now there are uh, precision technologies that can take care of that or this big data in agribusiness. Of course, that also brings opportunities. New jobs with innovation, research, development, and our region, Latin America, can't fall into the trap of populism and isolation. The way to go is consolidating our democracies, seeking competitiveness, and strengthening uh, foreign trade, opening up to opportunities in the world at large. Education and um, openness is part of the, of, the, of the solution, but Eduardo, you also work with uh, the youth. So an, ex an interesting example is Puerta 18. Uh, what can you tell us about exactly uh, are the solutions to include, incorporate, open those opportunities? I, I am surprised that you mentioned Puerta 18. It's a, one of the projects we are very proud of. We open a house in a middle class neighborhood where we receive a group of thousand, uh, mil, mil, mil chicos. A thousand children that receive technological uh, education and training outside school hours. At, the, in, at the, our company, we are convinced that the business that acts uh, in its environment, in its neighborhood, in its country has a great impact. We've done so for 20 years with a low level of dissemination of what we are doing. It's not the only project. There are children that have better technological capabilities now uh, than when they graduate from school and they asked us to replicate this model in a hundred other places. So we said no, since we are conservative we'll do it uh, in twos or threes. Education and entrepreneurship has been an objective for us. First we contributed to junior achievement but uh, when we gave a larger step forward, we worked through uh, and the Endeavor Foundation that was created in Buenos Aires 20 years ago, uh, which was to provide opportunities to entrepreneurs, identify them, give them seed capital, push them to go out to the capital markets. And I think one of the strongest things in all this was the process of selecting the give back capacity. A, give, a gift through selection and then a decade later donate for other entrepreneurs to be empowered. It's one of the foundations that's been most, more gratifying to me because at a time of crisis, for instance, with a volcano in Bariloche, the volcano eruption, for a whole year the hotel was empty. So we sent out nights at the hotel as a gift, and the entrepreneurs phoned and said, couldn't we all go together? There were 25 of them. And six years ago, we met for three days there to speak to the young entrepreneurs, business persons, and for me to find young uh, social and business entrepreneurs is to think of Argentina in the long term. So investment in education and entrepreneurship has been ongoing throughout two decades. The youth to a big challenge in the region, which is how do we um, overcome the over-dependency on commodities? How do we stop 
only not looking only at the ground but also looking at the people at talent and use our commodities as a means uh, to an end and more than what we've done have we learned the lessons from the past and i think it's a good question for you <laughs> thank you let's see i believe that what you mentioned about uh, depending on commodities, I would look at this within the context of cycles in oil as well as in many other industries and commodities. We have ups and downs in the cycles and we are used to that and always I wouldn't say always, but one of the solutions that the industrial sector has found is to focus on competitiveness because ultimately once the down cycle is over, one has to be more competitive to raise again. So competitiveness is a term, particularly in our region, that makes us think about efficiency. And efficiency can be misinterpreted as a problem of uh, destruction of jobs so or of creation so we have to address this more smartly because it's not a matter of a zero sum one or the other but instead we have to solve the issue of competitiveness by creating jobs and by being more efficient a practical example is what President Macri brought along as a challenge to us this year with Vaga Muerta. He undertook uh, the responsibility of energy in Argentina and he set the challenge of being more competitive. And what he provided us with was a very, very important framework that is dialogue. It seems very trivial, but it's a very powerful tool. And what he did was to create uh, forums for dialogue, very similar to what this forum does, where all sectors come together, trade unions, companies, provinces, and the national government. And th through dialogue, and sometimes by asking difficult questions, we find solutions. Solutions as to greater competitiveness through efficiency and more employment. Ashish? Oh. Okay. Uh, no, I thought you had I thought you had a comment. You do? No, sorry, I, I didn't know you were pointing to it. No, I, I just wanted to make one point about technology. And I think we all understand how much technology is done for us in many, many different ways, not just the smartphones that we all rely on. Mm but about clean water in India, about mm. the environment, about increased competitiveness and productivity, about the ability to treat our planet more effectively, uh, how we can use, you know, all the things about smart grids, electricity, all has been fantastic. And on the other hand, we do have to understand things like the WTO put out a report that says that half the manufacturing jobs in the United States, for example, could be lost to robotics and AI within the next five to 10 years. And then we came back to Marcus's point. We have that in the UK, certainly, and in many Western countries. We're in a digital world where we're not giving the right education to our children, to our young people. And that's critical. Otherwise, we've got bigger problems coming. Whatever the value of technology, which we need to do things cleaner, better, efficiently, but leaving people without the right education, without work, is going to be a huge problem, much bigger than any border problem or wall is going to solve in terms of cross-border trade. Thank you. I would also like to add that our region has a characteristic of ex exporting very qualified human resources to developed countries with an important uh, possibility to adapt to change because of our institution weakness and the level of development. We've been factories of resilience to big change and our challenge now is to see how to generate stability in our countries to better harness that talent because we are going into a cycle of great volatility and instability. So that's a competitive edge. We have our human resources, which we have to turn into a competitive edge for our countries. Everyone agrees that we all have to invest in education. 
And we all have to invest in the skills in education which build adaptability, learnability, self-efficacy. I think we all use different terms which make young people and adults more resilient to the change that's coming. The question is, what's the ratio of an investment in technology versus an investment in this type of education? And I think we're still learning what that ratio should be. But I think at the very least, we should start tracking that ratio because it is out of skew. And um, we've got great institutions in the room. This is, a, this is a rare opportunity to talk to this type of, of an audience. But I guess my call to action would be to start to look at that ratio and concretely try to improve it. Thank you. Um, let's talk about geopolitical, uh, the geopolitical context and also the fact that Argentina right now is uh, hosting the World Economic Forum, but next year uh, Argentina will take over the G20 presidency. Um, how can you use the G20 to put the region's priorities at, uh, at the global, in the global agenda? What would you say? We have several challenges ahead, uh, starting with this meeting, then we have the WTO ministerial meeting in December, and what we wish to have expressed is the voice of the region, not only of the country, and we are going to wor work towards that. We've spoken to IDB, to the Andean Development Bank, CAF, and to the integration institutions in our country and in our neighboring countries to generate an interactive process of dialogue, not only among governments, but also with the private sector and civil society of this new first uh, South American G20. What voice would we we contribute to the world we are living in and also to consider it a challenge of pedagogy and debate within our country. Within this crucial opportunity of understanding this as an opportunity and not a threat, we are working on that. We also have the Youth Olympic Games to be held in Buenos Aires next year. All these are opportunities for a country that sometimes lacks that self-esteem to realize that it can play in the world class level. And many times because of insecurity, we end up by living our failures. I believe that what our Chief of Cabinet Minister has said is part of training. To welcome this group is part of our training and WTO too, but to lead the G20 together with Canada leading the G7 is a unique opportunity because we are at a stage where opportunities are given signals of non-isolation or little isolation. and. The personal contact, personal relationship uh, of the presidents chairing both groups, G7 and G20 next year, I think will somehow uh, contribute to the leadership of the region. So uh, the leadership of Argentina will be very important. Uh, G20, um, as you might remember, in Baden-Baden during the G20 meeting, the, um, uh, the world's uh, biggest economies dropped a long-standing public endorsement for, of free trade. Uh, I'm sure you remember that. It made, it made headlines. So um, our question uh, for you is, um, there's, this seems to be the perfect opportunity for Argentina to make a push at the international stage and bring it back. Will we bring back that long-standing commitment to free trade, should we? Bueno, creo que, que esto es... I believe this is a multilateral matter. It can't be an imposition. The presidency of the G20 cannot impose a document as neither could Germany. We are clearly going to advocate for the value of free trade and of a greater integration of our economies, and also particularly from the standpoint of the developing countries that many times have uh, been leaders uh, of openness in our region, not particularly Argentina yet. We have to hold a debate on how to have more inclusive global trade with greater opportunities for all. That will no doubt be a priority, very much linked to the priority of job creation, quality job creation that is sustainable from the environmental standpoint, 
jobs uh, and for our country, for the next generations. That is at the core of the debate of what world we want and, of course, the democratic values. When these populist uh, threats uh, are there, this can be at risk, but that is a path for uh, the future. Is it only a commitment if we want to be represented at the G20 accurately? Should, should the region uh, have that push for the free trade enunciation in a statement to be represented, would you say? To, to, to be fair to the, to the G20, I think actually they didn't walk away from free trade. They talked about fair trade yes. rather than defeating protectionism. So there was a real concern about the, the degree of support for ensuring we don't do damage to ourselves through protectionism. So I, I think that that was perhaps uh, more the point. Um, I do think, you know, that the whole question of really understanding what we mean by free trade and globalization, how we get the balance right, and we probably do need at a, a country level sometimes and at a business level to understand there have been occasions, whether it's in the Rust Belt of the United States, whether it's in the coal mines of South Wales, where people have been left behind for generations. I mean, recently, just to give you an anecdote, that really shocked me. In BT, through our mobile uh, company, EE, we have a call center in a place called Merthyr Tydfil. It's in South Wales, it was a coal mining center. And we've built up about 800 people there. All the people we recruited in Merthyr Tydfil were third generation unemployed, living in the same house. The level of mental illness in Merthyr Tydfil is four times the national average. So we all, at a political level, at a, at a business level, you can't let those things happen. Otherwise, you get a political backlash, which is, I think, a little bit what we've seen. How about gender, moving on? Uh, gender also is a big issue in the region, and um, uh, opening up the spaces, the, uh, uh, just closing that salary gap, among many other possible solutions to acknowledge and also empower women as a, pow as a potent you know, economic agent and also for development. What's your takeaway? I have a very special reason for starting to look at this. I have a vested interest, you see, because I have two daughters, so I'm very interested in the matters of gender. And if I take a critical look at the oil industry, which is a rather male chauvinist uh, community because women are underrepresented in it. Um, I started to look at what initiatives there were in this regard and I found there are quite a few of them. Unfortunately, it is all only just taking off, but um, you see the issue of the low levels of participation of women in industries like oil uh, has a lot to do with education. How many women engineers does the educational system produce? And that has a lot to do with the number of professionals who reach the highest positions in companies. So from our humble position as individuals working in the industry, we are taking steps, the oil industry has got together to look at CVs um, or rather curricula in universities to encourage women also to study engineering and uh, eventually become leaders. I would also add the importance of empowering women for greater participation in all economic activities. In Brazil, that's just what we feel. The presence of women is increasing on all fronts. And I would particularly stress in our region the concern with regard to violence perpetrated against women. Unfortunately, Latin America is one of the most violent regions in the world the uh, issue of drugs is a serious problem throughout our region and the matter of public security is particularly significant. In Sao Paulo, 
Sao Paulo, we managed to reduce the murder rate from 30, uh, 35 to 8.2 uh, per 100,000 inhabitants. And we have worked on improving all laws in order to strongly punish violence perpetrated against women in Brazil, in our state and throughout the country. So uh, the gender focus is important, and one aspect of this is ending and punishing violence against women. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that you said that. I, yes. I think sometimes when we talk about women, we forget about poor women. We talk about women generally, we talk about professional women, but I think I'm glad you brought the perspective of violence against women, particularly for vulnerable populations. Um, and I think that the gender issue, you know, as we all know, leadership, that, that to bring change in this area really starts at the top. This is not one which will just bubble up on its own. This is something which we have to make a conscious choice. The leadership requires goals and it requires clarity of vision for what we want to do. And it requires mindset, a mindset shift. Um, you know, you mentioned um, being more personally attached to this, Marcos, because of your daughters. For all the men out there who don't have daughters, <laughs> what do we do to make this personal? And I think one way to think about that is through education. Because I think that um, traditional education won't change mindsets. Creating role models for girls will start to create the opportunity for them to think about careers they never thought was possible before. Role models is the key. Role models. Yesterday we launched a gender initiative in Argentina with the World Economic Forum that filled us with joy. And there are two driving ideas here. One is the importance of the political commitment to really set about working on this pending task, which is affording equal opportunity. There is an important role to be played by the government institutions and by corporate sector, taking also into consideration the role of mothers, everything that has to do with maternity leaves and, you know, the double challenges that women face, both in professional uh, contexts as well as in other occupational contexts. They need to achieve a balance between the work and looking after their children. And that's also important for families. So it's not just about offering equality from the point of view of discourse, but in actual fact. The issue that we're tackling as, as a region uh, in Latin America through this new initiative, uh, but this is a perfect set way to also talk about how much we heard the region needs to do its home, homework before thinking about Brexit. And, and yes, there are other topics, geopolitical topics that are important, but also we need to uh, a, a better uh, integrate our economies, our trade dynamics, investment, etc. So, uh, to Marcos Peña, um, how are you going to make this happen? This call for the region to look at itself and collaborate and integrate better. Integration in a region has often been more at the level of rhetoric than in actual fact, although a lot of progress has been made on the political front and it is a region of peace, cooperation and dialogue, something which wasn't the case 30 years ago. And even though intra-region trade has increased, we still still need a quality leap in terms of innovation. And this is a challenge we recognize in Microsoft. We recently visited Brazil and the cabinets of both countries, led by the presidents, sat down to work on the strategic alliance to see how to take that quality leap in terms of integration and in fact today there has also been a meeting of foreign ministers of uh, Mercosur and the Pacific Alliance countries to work on defining a common agenda. These discussions within the region as well as the possibility of discussing an agreement between the EU and Mercosur at least helps us pinpoint the challenges to recognize where exactly the key difficulties are. Clearly, there are interests that need to adapt. Uh, obviously, a lot of people have benefited a lot from a closed region that had no competition and was afraid to go out to the world. But that also carries with it unemployment, poverty, and the lack of development. So creating a virtuous mechanism for integration and growth is the way to go. And we need to do this through concrete steps and not just through rhetoric. 
idea to close this session. Uh, thank you to my panelists. I hope that we can just give them a round of applause for a way to close the session. And now, and now I would like to invite on stage Dr. Philip Rosler, uh, head of the regional and government engagement and member of the managing board of the World Economic Forum for the official closing of this event. Thank you, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. First, I would like to thank again our panelists, particularly under the leadership of Gabriela, our co-chairs for excellent guidance through our event, and Sir Michael Rake for walking literally an extra mile to participate even today. So thank you very much for being here, and thank you very much for all your roles. And ladies and gentlemen, I would like also thank our great host, Minister Piena. I would like to thank the government of Argentina, President Macri, as well as the city of Buenos Aires. Thank you for your great hospitality. And ladies and gentlemen, allow me to thank all the helping hands, our partners, our teams inside the World Economic Forum, and particularly everything under the leadership of our Latin American heart and soul, Marisol. Thank you, Marisol. last thank you goes to you for being here. It was by far the biggest Latin America summit we had at the World Economic Forum. So let's close with an agreement. I would like to ask you to stay committed, committed to improving the state of Latin America. And we, the World Economic Forum, we will remain as your foremost platform for public-private cooperation in order to turn all the ideas you had over this week the agreements and commitments to turn all these things into reality. And on that note, I would like to invite you now to our farewell reception. I wish you safe travels home and looking forward to see you at latest next year in Sao Paulo. Thank you very much. The Latin America Summit is closed.